Right. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me and thank you to Enrico and Guy for organising this meeting. My name is Paul McFadden and I'd like to tell you about some new work on conformal field theory in momentum space with my collaborators Adam Bozowski and Costa Skenderis. Uh, so we have a new result that I'm very excited about, which is that you can write the um, general endpoint correlation function in momentum space as a generalized Feynman integral with a topology of a simplex. And so in this talk, I'd like to tell you about this new result and some of the ways I think it could be useful for early universe cosmology. So let's start with inflationary correlators. So of course, it's been appreciated for a very long time now that inflationary correlators are very closely related to conformal field theory correlators. This is something that's very natural from a holographic perspective, but it's also something that you can think about from a purely kinematical, kinematical perspective as well, has been emphasized in recent work. So during inflation, the space-time geometry is very close to De Sitter space, and we're interested in reconstructing cosmological correlators on constant time slices towards the end of the inflationary epoch. So if we're in exact De Sitter space, then the action of the four-dimensional De Sitter isometries on these late time slices, these De Sitter isometries act as three-dimensional conformal transformations. So that means that De Sitter correlation functions on late time slices have to obey exactly the same set of constraints as conformal field theory correlators. These are the conformal ward identities. So in fact, you can construct and organize cosmological correlators in exactly the same way as you would do for CFT correlators. If you want to understand slow roll inflation where the geometry is close to De Sitter but not quite De Sitter, then there's a whole um, host of tools available from conformal field theory to do this, conformal perturbation theory and soft theorems. So from a cosmological perspective, it's very natural to work in momentum space. So the first question we'd like to understand is, what is the general form of endpoint correlation functions in momentum space in a CFT? And, and surprisingly, you know, despite nearly 50 years work on CFT, this until recently has been an open question. So once you've answered this question, once you know the general form of endpoint correlators in momentum space CFT, then you can seek to bootstrap cosmological correlators by supplying additional physical inputs. And this is something that's been sort of explored in these recent cosmological bootstrap papers. For example, um, you know, Bunch Davis vacuum at very early times corresponds to the fact that um, CFT correlators on the boundary have no collinear singularities. And you can also look at the flat space limit of cosmological correlation functions or CFT correlation functions where they reduce to flat space scattering amplitudes. So just by way of introduction, let's just sort of quickly recap what's known about the form of correlation functions in position space. So two and three point functions, they're all fixed up to constants, just the scaling dimensions of operators, these big deltas, as well as the normalization of the two point functions and the OPE coefficients, which are effectively the normalization of the three point function. And this has been known since the work of Polygon in the 70s. In this talk, I'm going to be talking about Euclidean signature, and I'm not going to be specific about the space-time dimension other than it's greater than two. Obviously, for cosmology, we're interested in d equals three. And xij is the coordinate separation xi minus xj. So high point functions, they depend on these conformal cross ratios. And remarkably, the cross ratios have been known since at least the fourth century AD, um, the, the reign of the Roman emperor Domitian. So, so Pappas of Alexandria used them in his um, hexagon theorem, and, and, and uh, this is a rather gorgeous 17th century reprint of Pappas's work. So skipping forward 16 centuries um, to 1970, um, we, we know that high point correlators in, in, um, in CFT, we know that they're given by arbitrary functions of these conformal cross ratios. So we've got an arbitrary function f, and I'm going to denote some set of independent conformal cross ratios as a vector u like this. So, so this isn't a space-time vector u, it just runs over the set of independent cross ratios. And as well as a function, then we've got a prefactor which consists of powers of the coordinate separations and the powers alpha ij, these are constants, they just satisfy this constraint here in terms of the external operator dimensions. So yeah, so, so four and high point correlation functions, they involve an arbitrary function of the cross ratios. So for momentum space CFT, the questions we have to answer are the following. So first off, what is the general form of the endpoint correlator in momentum space? And in particular, you know, I, I want this for arbitrary operator dimensions. I want this for arbitrary space-time dimensions. I'm going to focus in this talk just on scalar correlators, but in the longer term, we'd like to understand tensorial correlators as well. 
So first off, what's the general form of the endpoint correlator? Second, what is the analog of the conformal cross ratios? So in position space, we've got an arbitrary function of these position space cross ratios. In momentum space, there should be the same number of degrees of freedom. So we expect that correlators in momentum space, they should involve an arbitrary function of some objects, some variables that play the role of cross ratios. And then, okay, so that's the general correlator involve an arbitrary function of these variables. If you give me some specific correlator of interest, then we want to know how do we go about finding the form of this function. So in particular for cosmological correlators or, or you know, correlators in ADS-CFT, we'd like to know what is the form? How do we go about finding the form of this function? And yeah, so in this talk, we're gonna answer actually all three of these questions. So this is work based on two recent papers with um, Adam and Costas. And the plan of this talk is as follows. So there are two parts. So first off, I'd just like to introduce these simplex integrals that give the general solution of the momentum space conformal ward identities. So Costas and I have agreed to split our talk. So, so Costas and his talk is gonna focus on proving that this simplex integral solves the conformal ward identities. In my talk, I'd like to focus more on some of the applications to holographic CFTs. So I'd like to tell you about how to solve the sort of simplest holographic correlator, you know, the endpoint contact diagram, and I'd like to tell you how to write that as a simplex integral. And to do that, we're going to use some sort of other rather wonderful tools from electrical circuit theory, this star mesh duality. So what we show, so, so, so our result is that the um, endpoint correlation function could be written as a generalized Feynman integral. Uh, as I said earlier, it's got the topology of a simplex. So it's an n minus one simplex. Um, and n minus one simplex is the fully connected graph of n points. So a two simplex is a triangle, a three simplex is a tetrahedron. The, uh, the, the terminology is a little confusing. So, okay, so, so, so let's label some momenta. So we've got a simplex like this, and let's label all the external momenta as P. And then we've got these internal momenta that run between the different vertices of the simplex. So the internal momenta I'm gonna label as Q, and I'm gonna give them a label. So QIJ is gonna be the momentum running from vertex I to vertex J and so forth. So what we show is that the general, the most general endpoint correlation function looks like this. So this is a simplex integral. So let me run, run you through it through its, through its bits and pieces. So the idea is that for every, for every leg of the simplex, for every edge of the simplex, we have a generalized propagator, you know, QIJ, the momentum running from vertex I to J. And it's a generalized propagator because it appears with some power to alpha IJ plus D. Alphas are just constants and they satisfy this constraint here. This is the same constraint we saw in position space. What we do is we integrate over all the internal momentum on the simplex. So we integrate over all the internal momenta which run between all the different vertices of the simplex, but we apply momentum conservation at every vertex of the simplex. So the simplex has n vertices, and at each one we've got one of these delta functions that constrains the sum of the internal momenta flowing into that vertex has got to be the external momenta, the p. Okay, and then the, the, the magic ingredient then is this arbitrary function f hat. So the general endpoint function involves an arbitrary function f hat, and f hat depends on these variables that are well, that we call the momentum space cross ratios for obvious reasons here. So, so basically we've got an arbitrary function of these momentum space cross ratios, and they look very similar to the position space cross ratios, and indeed they play the same role as the position space cross ratios, but they're not quite the same thing because you can see that they involve these, here the QIJs, these are internal momenta that are subject to integration. The other difference, of course, is that in position space, xij is the separation of two coordinates, xi and xj, whereas here in momentum space, qij is the momentum running from vertex i to j on the simplex. So, so in particular, it's not a difference. It's not qi minus qj, like it would be in position space. So modulo those, uh, modulo those differences, it, uh, we find that the momentum space endpoint function is an arbitrary function of these momentum space cross ratios and you know, the number of degrees of freedom is the same. Again, there are n, n minus three over two of these independent momentum space cross ratios. So, so, so this is what we mean by simplex integral, and you can prove that this is a solution, this is the general solution of the conformal ward identities. Um, it's the general solution because it involves the same number of degrees of freedom, an arbitrary function of n, n minus three over two variables. You can check that it solves the dilatation ward identity just by power counting. 
you know, the dilatation ward identity just tells you the overall dimension of a correlator. And you can check that just by power counting on the right hand side. The special conformal ward identities you have to be, uh, you have to work a little bit harder to prove. The, the, the basic way it works is that, so the special conformal ward identities, you've got a differential operator in the external momenta. Um, when you act with that on the simplex, you can, it only acts on these, um, the external momenta, they only appear inside this delta function, inside these delta functions here. So you can rewrite derivatives with external momenta as derivatives with respect to the internal momenta, the QIJs. And then it turns out that they form a total derivative. So, so, so basically, the special conformal ward identities, they act on the integrand of the simplex, and they form a total derivative with respect to the internal momentum that we're integrating over. So then that vanishes, and so that proves that this is the solution of the conformal ward identities. So Costas will cover that in his talk. So, okay, so, so, so moving on, so first off, you know, we, we've got these n delta functions that enforce momentum conservation at each vertex. So what we can do is we can integrate over a subset of momenta to remove those delta functions. So what we do is we pick the nth vertex and then we integrate over all the momenta running into that nth vertex. And then what we're left with is basically an overall, a single overall delta function for momentum conservation, which we can pull out. And then that leaves this remaining um, reduced correlator that we write with double brackets like this. So after removing the delta function of momentum conservation, um, we've got this reduced simplex integral like here. And basically it's just the same as what we had before, except that we've removed the nth. Um, the denominator only runs over the vertices one up to n minus one because we integrated out all the internal momentum running into the nth vertex. And so, okay, so, 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 so that basically this just leaves us with n minus one choose two integrations left to perform. So for n equals three, that leaves us with a one loop integral. For n equals four, that leaves us with a three loop integral and so forth. So, okay, as a first check, let, let, let's just see what happens to a two and three point correlation functions where, where, where you know, we know what the answer has to be. So for two and three point functions, there's sort of two special things that happen. First off, because we haven't got four points, there's no cross ratios we can make. So this arbitrary function f hat is just a constant. The second thing that happens is that the solution of this constraint equation for these parameters alpha ij, that you have a unique solution for two and three point function, which you wouldn't for higher point functions. So, so that fixes these, these parameters alpha ij uniquely. So if we look at a two point function, solving this constraint tells us that the two operators in the two point function have to have the same dimension, which is correct. And the simplex integral just reduces to a power like this. And again, of course, we know that's correct. In position space, the two-point correlator is a power in the coordinate separation. So the Fourier transform of a power stays a power. So we get the two-point function correct. And indeed, the three-point function also comes out correct. So the three-point function is a two-simplex, which is a triangle integral. Um, and so, so yeah, so the three-point function just comes out of this triangle integral here. And the um, powers to which the propagators are raised is given by solving this constraint here. And so this is the solution. Delta total is the sum of all the internal dimensions. So yeah, so, so in fact, as we'll see later in the talk, this triangle integral can also be written as an integral of three Bessel functions, a, a triple K integral. And of course, that's exactly what we'd expect from a holographic perspective. You can also rewrite this integral in terms of the um, double hypergeometric function, Apple F4 as well. So yeah, so the two and three point function come out correctly. What happens for the four-point function? So the four-point function is given by a tetrahedral integral. So yeah, so what we've done is we've just solved momentum conservation at each vertex. And just like in position space for the four-point function, there are two independent cross ratios, which we can choose like this. And if I use the momentum routing shown in this diagram here, then I can rewrite these cross ratios like this. So the P's of the external momentum coming into the diagram and then Q1, Q2, and Q3 are just internal momenta that I'm going to integrate over. And this is a, the tetrahedron is a three loop integral. So there's Q1, Q2, and Q3 that we integrate over. So this is the general solution for the momentum space four point function. It's a tetrahedron integral. We integrate over these three internal momenta, Q1, Q2, and Q3. We've got an arbitrary function F hat of the momentum space cross ratios. And then the denominator 
is just basically giving you a generalized propagator for each leg of the tetrahedron. And the powers to which these propagators are raised is fixed by this, by any solution of this condition here. So this is one particular solution of that condition. In fact, at, you know, as we said earlier, the solutions are not unique for four and higher point functions, but it, it basically doesn't make any difference. If I chose a different solution of this constraint for the parameters alpha, then that would just multiply this arbitrary function f hat by some powers of the cross ratios u hat and v hat. And because this is an arbitrary function, you know, that, that, that doesn't matter. So we can just pick this solution and stick with that. Uh, yeah, okay. So you can prove that these simplex integrals give you the general solution of the conformal ward identities. Um, for the rest of this talk, I'd like to focus on the question of how do we go about finding this function f hat for some specific correlator of interest? So, so, so you know, let, 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 let's start off with holographic correlators. You know, let, let's start off with the simplest possible holographic correlator, just a scalar contact diagram in ADS CFT. And in future work, we'd like to sort of generalize this to understand exchange diagrams. Uh, I, I mean, they're really not so different after all. You know, an exchange diagram you can write as a sum of contact diagrams. I mean, maybe an infinite sum, but um, you, you can reduce an exchange to a sum of contacts. And we'd also like to understand inflationary and decisic correlators. And again, it's, it's really, I mean, I mean, the methods I'm describing will work perfectly well for decisic correlators. You really just analytically continue um, Bessel case to Hankel functions. So, so it's a, that's a, yeah. If I had another week, I'd, I'd do it and tell you about it. But um, so, okay, so, so, so the question is, how do we go about finding the simplex representation of a contact, a contact Witten diagram? So, this gives us a solution for the endpoint function as an integral over m bulk to boundary propagators on ADS, and these are given by these Bessel k functions here. And z is just the radial coordinate of the interaction, so, so we integrate over that um, radial position. And we Fourier transformed in all the boundary directions, so there's no need to integrate over the boundary directions, we've just got these momenta here. These p's are momentum magnitudes. So, okay, so, so, so this contact diagram, this is a solution of the conformal ward identities. Um, uh, what we'd like to do is work out for our simplex integral, what's the, form, what's the form of this function f hat? So in other words, what's the simplex representation of this contact diagram? So, you know, there, there's a lot of ways of sort of thinking about this. Um, I mean, you might start, you, you, could, you could write down differential equations. You know that this contact diagram doesn't depend on any of the Mandelstam variables. It only depends on the magnitude of the external momentum. So you could write down a partial differential equation like d by ds or d by dt or d by du is zero. And then you could try and solve what f hat is. Um, here, what we're going to do is just, just a sort of, you know, perhaps the simplest possible sort of brute force approach. So we're literally just going to show using Schwinger parameters how to sort of rewrite this contact diagram as a simplex integral. And yeah, the method we're going to use is quite interesting. I think it'll be sort of generally useful. So first, just to sort of put us in gear, I'd like to swing and parameterize the contact diagram. So I'd like to rewrite all the Bessel K bulk boundary propagators as an integral over a Schwinger parameter, capital Z, of a sort of exponential function like this. So this is just a standard integral representation. So if I rewrite all the bulk boundary propagators like this, then I can do the radial integral over this little Z coordinate. And then that leaves us with a sort of pure Gaussian sort of integral. So we've got this integral over these um, n Schwinger parameters, capital Z. Z total is the sum of Z1 plus Z2 all the way up to Zn. And all that's left then is an exponential of this sort of Gaussian factor here. So, 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 so what's nice, okay, so this is now our sort of starting point. So, so, so the sort of starting observation is that the exponent here you can think of as the, as the power dissipation in a star-shaped network of electrical resistors. So that, yeah, I, I, it's been known for a long time that there's sort of analogies between Feynman integrals and, and, and electrical circuits. The general way it works is like we do here. You, once you swing a parameterize and put all your propagators into the exponent, you get, you get something that looks a bit like a sort of Gaussian integral and the exponent you can think of as the power dissipation in an electrical circuit. So, so that's exactly what's going on here. So in this sort of analogy, the external momentum, the P's, these are like the currents in our, in our electrical circuits and the Schwinger parameters, the Z's, these are the conductivities in our electrical circuit. So the power is the um, current squared divided by the conductivity. So what we want to do is we want to go from these contact diagrams to a sort of simplex, to a network with a simplex topology. 
And indeed, the, the, you know, there's, there's well-known sort of results from electrical circuit theory that allow us to do exactly that. So, I mean, the famous one is the, um, uh, the one between, a, the famous one is this one here between like a, a three star and a triangle. But in fact, it's a very general relation. Um, so for the four point function, you can write and the power dissipation in an electrical network with four resistors arranged in this star topology like this, you can rewrite this circuit as a completely equivalent circuit with a tetrahedral network of resistors like this. And there's a sort of relation between the, um, uh, the conductivities of the resistors on the star and on the simplex, and similarly the currents on the star are related to the currents on the simplex. In electrical engineering jargon, they call the simplex a mesh, but um, it's really a simplex from our point of view. So the conductivities on the star are these capital Zs, and the conductivities on the mesh are these small Zs, and they're related by this relation here. The you know, big Z total is the sum of the Z1 all the way up to Zn. And similarly, the currents on the star are given by these Ps, and the currents on the mesh, on the simplex, are, I've written with an I like this. So IJK is the current running from vertex J to vertex K on the simplex. And of course, the current is really just the momentum on the simplex in, in our analogy. So this is something that works. This formula, this, this works for the general endpoints diagram. So, so, so you have an endpoint uh, electrical network with an N star topology corresponds to a simplex, an N minus one simplex. Um, and the relation is this relation here. So yeah, okay, so, so actually, so, so, so where, did, where did this relation come from? Well, it just comes from solving Kirchhoff's law. So you've got momentum conservation at each vertex, which is equivalent to current conservation. And Kirchhoff's second law is that the voltage drop around every closed loop vanishes. And again, you, you can check that that, that, it, that is satisfied. And in fact, that, that, that relation is actually crucial to the um, manipulations that follow. So, Yep, so, so the starting point is that you've got these two equivalent electrical networks and the power dissipation in both networks is the same. So we can convert from a contact diagram, which corresponds to this star topology, to a diagram with a topology of a simplex by replacing the conductivities on the star with the mesh with the simplex conductivities, and we can replace the currents on the star with the currents on the simplex. So that just converts us from the star the contact topology to the mesh which is the simplex topology um, for n is greater than four, greater than equal to four of course um, you've got you know if you think about the four point function which is a tetrahedron the tetrahedron has six legs so you've got six resistors on a tetrahedron whereas that came from a four star which had only four resistors so not all the um, resistors on the simplex are independent so you've just got to pick a subset of n independent uh, resistors on the simplex and yes, these resistors are really Schwinger parameters. We're integrating over them. So when you change from the contact, contact to the simplex topology, you get a Jacobian factor. And the really neat part is that you can rewrite that Jacobian factor as an integral over internal currents running around the simplex. You know, we, 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 know, we know from the formula that we, you know, we know that the CFT correlator is given by the simplex integral, and the simplex integral involves integrating over all the internal currents running around the simplex. And in this calculation, what happens is that those internal, um, that, that, that integration over these internal currents or momentum running around the simplex, that reproduces the Jacobian coming from this change of variables from the resistors on the um, star diagram to the resistors on the simplex. So in the final stage, you then just integrate out, you know, any, any remaining Schwinger parameters that you can. So, so, so let's see what happens. Okay, so, so for the three-point contact diagram, uh, we, we can rewrite it in terms of this uh, three-star electrical network. And, and, and this, um, since, since 1899, it's been known that the power dissipation is equivalent to the one in this um, triangular network like this. And using that procedure I was just describing, you can write the three-point contact diagram, which is this integral of three Bessel functions here, this triple K integral. You can rewrite that as a triangle integral like this, a tri you know, triangle final integral. And the integration is over this internal momentum Q, that's, that's the momentum running around the triangle. And we introduced that to, to, to remove the Jacobian coming from the change of variables from, from the big Zs to the little Zs. So, okay, so the three-point function comes out correctly. You know, in the beginning of the talk, we were saying 
the, um, the, the, the simplex integral for the three-point function reduced to a triangle integral. And indeed, that's what we get here. And because the three-point function is universal, it's completely fixed by conformal symmetry, it had to be true that the contact diagram on the left-hand side reduced to the um, simplex integral, the triangle integral on the right-hand side. So, so that's all good. For the four-point functions, okay, so, so the four-point contact diagram here, we find it can be written indeed as a tetrahedral integral. And the arbitrary function f hat that appears, this is the curious part. It turns out that the arbitrary function takes the form of a triple k integral two, but it's a triple k integral involving these momentum space cross ratios. So, you know, if you compare it for the three point contact diagram, we've got this triple k integral here, but it involves the momentum magnitudes. For the four point function, the arbitrary function that appears is a triple k integral, but it involves the uh, momentum space cross ratios, u hat and v hat. So the triple k integral, as we just saw, is equivalent to a triangle integral. So there's this sort of interesting pattern where, you know, the four point contact diagram, the function f hat that appears in the tetrahedron representation is given by a triple k or a triangle integral. So the endpoint contact diagram, it has an f hat, you know, a, 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 a function of cross ratios f hat that corresponds to an n minus one point um, polygon integral. So, 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 yeah, so the, the, this holds the general n. So, so, so for the, um, for, for, for the general contact diagram where n is greater than or equal to four, we find that the function of cross ratios that appears f hat takes the form of a n minus one point polygon integral. So if you have an n minus one point polygon integral, uh, you obviously you can't do it exactly, but what you can do is you can Feynman parameterize it. So it has a Feynman parameterization in terms of n minus two Feynman parameters, which are these z's here. So here I'm integrating over variables z one i, and i runs from two to n, so that's n minus one variables. But there's a delta function here, so that gives you n minus two. Um, that, that means there's n minus two integrals to do. And then we've got this quadratic denominator here that's quadratic in the Feynman parameters, the z's, and then it involves these momentum space cross ratios here. These are the um, independent momentum space cross ratios. This is one particular way of parameterizing the um, independent momentum space cross ratios. The a variables run from four to n. So, okay, you, you know, that may look, yeah, if you spend enough time doing Feynman diagrams, you can sort of instantly recognize this as the um, Feynman parameterization of an n minus one point polygon. Uh, the difference is just that the um, momenta that would appear in the polygon integral are now replaced with cross ratios of, of, of the um, momenta on, on, on the simplex. So that's the general form of the endpoint contact diagram. So, so just, uh, yeah, so, so time is short. Let me just summarize here. So, 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 so basically our results are that we found the general solution of the conformal ward identities in momentum space for scalar correlators. So the general CFD scalar endpoint function can be written as a simplex integral like this, and it involves an arbitrary function of these momentum space cross ratios here. And these play the same role as the cross ratios in position space, but bear in mind that they're um, cross ratios in these momentum QIJ, which run along the legs of the simplex. So they're subject to integration here. And okay, so, 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 so we're discussing briefly how we can find the form of this arbitrary function F hat for particular correlators of interest in, in holographic theories, for example. And we saw the contact diagram. We can use these tricks from electrical circuit theory, the star mesh transformation to rewrite, um, to rewrite a contact diagram, which has a star topology as a mesh integral, which has a simplex topology. And, and, and this is really a very general trick. You know, if you want to do an exchange diagram, you can basically use the same sort of um, star mesh transformation tricks. Um, when it, whenever you've got a, a bulk vertex that you're integrating over you know, in, in your Witten diagram, in the electrical circuit analogy, that becomes a sort of um, an internal node in your electrical circuit that you're integrating out. So this is a very general sort of trick. And, and indeed, there's, there's another trick we found that's very useful that we discuss in the paper, just, just using the convolution theorem and the um, recursive structure of these simplex integrals. So to summarize, I mean, there are really many open directions. I mean, of course, you, you know, we'd like to find the simplex representation of a wider range of contact, di uh, a wider range of diagrams, um, exchanges, loops, I mean, cosmological correlators, of course. 
a very interesting topic is to understand the singularities of these simplex integrals. Um, because these are generic Feynman integrals, we, we've got all the sort of standard tools of Feynman integrals to, to extract the singularities of these correlators. And the singularities, there's a lot of information here. I mean, I mean, you know, the flat space limit taking us from CFT correlators to scattering amplitudes. What we need to do is we need to find the energy poles in correlators and extract the residue. So this is something we should be able to do, you know, for the general simplex integral. And we'd like to understand how does this arbitrary function of cross ratios f hat, how does that relate to the scattering amplitudes we obtain in the flat space limit? Also, of course, there, there are going to be special values, the operator and space-time dimension for which divergences occur, and then we, we need to renormalize these correlators, and then there'd be sort of anomalies and beta functions associated with this. So, so the singularity structure there is also very interesting. We'd like to understand how to find the simplex representation for more general correlators involving tensorial operators, you know, currents, stress tensors, higher spins. You, know, you can certainly construct solutions using these spin raising operators that have been studied in, in recent work. Uh, it'd be interesting to understand whether this is the most general solution or whether these are just sort of particular solutions. Uh, you know, more generally, of course, you, you, you could always decompose the tensor. You could solve the group theory problem to find the most general tensor structure of your correlator. So you'd write it in terms of a, you know, a sort of minimal tensorial basis made up of the um, momenta and the metric tensor, the delta ij, chronic delta. So, so you'd write down the basis of the general tensors times scalar form factors, and then you'd find what do the conformal ward identities um, impose on those scalar form factors. Um, and uh, you know, so, 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 so uh, another key area of interest for this simplex representation would be to do the conformal bootstrap in momentum space. So of course, there's been a lot of um, fantastic progress understanding the bootstrap conditions in CFT in position space, we, we, we're wondering whether we can do something similar in momentum space, in particular tensorial correlators, you know, momentum space methods are sort of very promising for tensorial correlators. So, so we, we suspect there could be progress. This simplex representation could be a way of understanding the conformal bootstrap in momentum space. And, and of course, for, for, from a cosmological perspective, of course, we're also interested in understanding um, cosmological correlators. So, so, so bear in mind the simplex integral, this is telling us about the most general endpoint function on late time slices that are consistent with the sitter symmetry. So we feel this is really the general starting point for any approach to the cosmological bootstrap. You know, first off, you write down the most general solution that's consistent with the sitter symmetry, which corresponds to the most general CFT endpoint function. And then from that, you can then apply further conditions telling you about the um, you know, the early time vacuum of correlators and you look at the singularity structure, how it reduces in the flat space limit and so forth. So I think, I think it'd be very interesting to explore this simplex representation in the context of the cosmological bootstrap. So yeah, this is something I hope to discuss with you all next week. I look forward to seeing you then.